announcement few people saw coming. Comedian Jon Stewart announced last night that he is stepping down as host of The Daily Show. It's been an, an, an absolute privilege. It's been the, the, the honor of my professional life. And uh, I thank you for, for watching it, for hate watching it. Whatever reason <laughs> you were tuning in for, uh, it, you get in this business with the idea that maybe uh, uh, you have a point of view and, and something to express and to receive uh, feedback from that is th the greatest feeling you can ask for. Earlier today, I sat down with a media expert to talk about Stewart's legacy. Martha Bayless is a professor at Boston College and the author of, among other books, Through a Screen Darkly, Popular Culture, Public Diplomacy, and America's Image Abroad. Martha, thank you for being here. It's a pleasure. So there's been a real hue and cry on social media, in legacy media, and in newsrooms, workplaces like this one, at the news that Jon Stewart is stepping down as mm -hmm. host of The Daily Show. Why are people so deeply affected by this news? Um, I think it's because he's filled the space that used to be filled by network anchors like Walter Cronkite in the old days. Um, some have compared him to Johnny Carson, but I think his relationship to the news is actually more important. And for a lot of people, I think they're wondering where they're going to get the take on the news that they want to get if he's not there doing it. Walter Cronkite, of course, was known in some circles as the most trusted man in America. And I'm wondering if you think that Jon Stewart had that same level of trust from his audience? I think he does. Um, and it's not in spite of his ironic sort of satirical thing. I think it's because of his ironic and satirical approach. Because I think, you know, younger generation trusts that more than they do the straight news. And so do a lot of older people, because we've become somewhat disillusioned with the straight news, or at least we've become tired of it. And that ironic distance and that kind of uh, what passes for sophistication um, is very appealing to people, and they, they trust it more. I hear you use the phrase, what passes for sophistication. Is that a backhanded swipe at Jon Stewart? Do you think he was less sophisticated than people gave him credit for? No, it's not a swipe at him. It's a swipe at people who uh, kind of copy that style, but don't have his grasp of the issues, and don't have his wit, and don't have his uh, sort of... He, he really understands a lot of the issues and the events that he's talking about. A lot of people imitate the style, but they don't have the substance. I want to ask you if you think Jon Stewart was a political partisan. And before you answer that question, I want to roll some video of one of his more famous bits, this takedown he did, an epic takedown lavishly constructed mm -hmm. of Glenn Beck, the former Fox News host, who was prone, of course, to sort of conspiracy-minded ramblings written feverishly on his blackboard. So let's take a look at Jon Stewart aping Glenn Beck. Conservative libertarian. Let's start with conservative. Oh, well, what's this word right here? Con. A con is a convict. So was Jon Stewart a political partisan? Is that, an attack for, uh, is that an attack from the left on the right, or is there something else going on there? I think he, he sort of wears his politics on his sleeve. Um, and partisan is a dirty word now, meaning it's a kind of mindless adherence to a kind of party line. I don't think I would say that about him. He definitely has a bias and a slant, but this is not unusual in our broadcast media these days. It's very hard to find. In fact, that's one reason why people think the mainstream news, news programs are so, quote, boring, because they don't put their own slant into it. That's a big debate. That's network um, programs. Yeah. And in contrast, yeah. you have places like MSNBC or Fox, oh, which do yeah. the exact opposite. And those are Jon Stewart's favorite targets, or at least in the media, those are his favorite targets. And I actually admire the way he sends them up. I don't think he's an equal opportunity uh, satirist that way. Harder on the right than the left. He's much harder on Fox than he is on MSNBC or even CNN. Um, but he lands a few blows on the other ones, too. What was his role? Was he a comedian? Was he a satirist? Was he a serious media critic? Was he something else? I would call him a political satirist or a media satirist, which means he's satirizing the media. But he also spent a lot of time satirizing our, the foolishness of our politics. I would call him a, a satirist, but the word satirist is used very loosely these days to apply to a lot of people who really aren't doing satire. I was hoping, I'll confess, that you were going to say that he was a media critic, because I always felt like 
he was very sophisticated on The Daily Show and had these really substantive criticisms mm -hmm. to make of a whole swath of media and the way they operate. But I felt like whenever people tried to give him credit for that seriousness and engage him in a, a serious debate, he would sort of dodge it by saying, oh, you know, you, you're being too, uh, you're giving me too much credit. I'm just a comedian. And actually, I want, since we're talking about that, mm -hmm. to look at uh, this famous exchange he had on the show Crossfire uh, more than a decade ago now in which he took Paul Begala and Tucker Carlson to task for, as he saw it, basically helping to ruin and corrode American politics. So let's take a look at that. Your partisan, um, what do you call it, hacks. Wait, John, wait, like, let, me, so, let me tell you something valuable that I think we do that I'd like to see you something do. Something valuable? You yeah, no, well, yeah. it's, it's I nice like when, to, I would when like politicians, to hear it. When, uh, and I'll tell you, when politicians come on, yeah. it's nice to get them to try and answer the question. And mm -hmm. in order to do that, we try and ask them pointed questions. I want to contrast our questions with some questions you asked John Kerry. If, 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 you want to, if you want to compare your show to a comedy show, you're more than no, no, welcome but here's, to. No, no, here's, here's the point. If, if, Kerry that's, doesn't have, if that's your goal, no, it's not. I would name for here's, us, I'd name for here's the problem. That's Kerry a very good show. Kerry so there we see John Stewart balking at being considered a journalist. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that changed over time? <clears throat> um, I think his attitude toward journalism um, comes out not in what he says about himself, but in what he did when he took a leave recently and made this film about a, um, a very brave journalist, um, uh, Mazar, Mazari uh, Bahari. You're talking about the movie Rosewater? Yeah, the movie Rosewater, which is about this Iranian, he's a Canadian, but he's Iranian in, in his background. And he was put in jail in 2009 in Tehran uh, after t reporting on the uh, elections of 2009 and the demonstrations that followed it. And uh, he wrote a book, uh, and John Stewart has made a film about him. And I think John Stewart has an idea of journalism in the rest of the world, where it takes a lot of guts and a lot of courage to do this boring thing called straight reporting. You know, Americans, I think we're spoiled. Mm -hmm. we, ha we can find out information uh, on lots of things quite effortlessly. So we decide the straight news is boring. We want to be entertained. But there's places in the world where information and, and straight reporting is a lifeblood and it's being deprived people are being deprived of it by their governments and if John Stewart understands that then he's way ahead of a lot of people who consider themselves media critics two quick questions uh, for you before we rack up <laughs> wrap up um, first do you think he changed the way the media does business with all his critiques do you think he changed the MO uh, it may be too soon to tell okay. I think uh, something a lot depends on what follows him, A, what he's going to do after he steps down, and B, um, if they can find a host who's even remotely in the same yeah. ballpark. I think that's going to be a real challenge. Okay, my last question for you. Uh, there's already sort of a Stuart backlash brewing online today with people mm -hmm. talking about him fostering things like sarcasm, snideness, the detachment you talk about, but <clears throat> run amok in lesser mm -hmm. hands. Do you think he has a negative legacy as well? Well, sure. That's kind of what I said first. Yep. I think I think he certainly didn't create it. It was created when the media were deregulated in the 1980s by the Reagan administration. And the first thing that happened after that was Rush Limbaugh came on the radio with his with his talk show radio, and you no longer had to observe the fairness doctrine. You no longer had to be fair and balanced. But he might have helped perpetuate it. You think? I think he I think he turned it into a sophisticated kind of satire. But it was already there, and I'm afraid when he steps off the stage it will remain there without anybody to satirize it, which would right. be worse. Martha Bayless, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome.